The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. O Almighty God, who willest to be glorified in thy saints, and this raise up thy servant Benedict to shine as a light in the world. Shine, we pray thee, in our hearts, that we also in our generation may show forth thy grace, who has called us out of darkness into thy marvelous light. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God. Pour into our hearts such love for thee, that we, loving thee above all things, may obtain thy promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first lesson is written in the second chapter of the book of Proverbs, beginning at the first verse. My child, if you accept my words and treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, if you indeed cry out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk blamelessly, guarding the paths of justice and preserving the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. The word of the Lord. I will only give thanks unto the Lord. His praise shall ever be in my heart. My soul shall make the most in the Lord. The second lesson is written in the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, beginning at the 42nd verse. 
and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things done in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and distributed them to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and the breaking bread in their homes, they partook of food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. The word of the Lord. is written in the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, beginning at the 12th verse. Jesus said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. This I command you, to love one another. The Gospel of Christ. Through whom all things were made, who for us. 
please be seated. I begin with a pastoral, pastoral letter um, from Father Nathan Humphrey, now our eighth rector. Dear people, neighbors, and friends of St. Thomas's, I had hoped to be with all of you by Canada Day, the 1st of July, and to spend the 4th of July, known in the United States, of course, as Independence Day, at a safe distance from any amateur fireworks displays. But circumstances have turned out otherwise, and I am grateful to Father D'Angelo for reading this letter of greeting and encouragement this morning. Reflecting on Canada Day and American Independence Day, I could make the case that these two civic holidays stand for opposite values. Canada Day venerates peace, order, and good government, whilst Independence Day idolizes life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The former places the good of the community at the center, whilst the, the latter glorifies the freedom of individual endeavor above all else. Of course, it's not quite as simple as all that, but at the same time, this characterization is not far from the truth. Today, by special permission of the Bishop of Toronto, we are celebrating the Feast of St. Benedict instead of the usual propers appointed for this Sunday. St. Benedict's Day is July 11th, so I originally chose this Sunday as my first Sunday at St. Thomas's. But as an old Yiddish proverb puts it, man plans, God laughs. And so I will, God willing, at last be with you in person next Sunday. St. Benedict is a very important saint to me personally because I had the privilege of living with some Benedictine monks over a couple of summers in college and seminary and often visited the monastery on long weekends and over school vacations. It was at that monastery that I first began to discern the shape of my Christian vocation to the priesthood, and I recall those days with gratitude and fondness. As the founder of Western monasticism, St. Benedict is best known for the rule that bears his name. Just as the Declaration of Independence with its proclamation of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is the founding document of the United States, and the Constitution Act with its proclamation of peace, order, and good government is the founding document of Canada, the rule of St. Benedict is the constitution of Benedictine monasticism, and in every monastery the world over, the monks read at least one chapter from it every day. Benedict's rule stresses the authority of an abbot over his monks, the dependence of the monk on his community, and the rootedness to be found in one place until death. In Benedict's rule, we find the three Benedictine vows of obedience, stability, and conversion of life. When we contemplate the rule of St. Benedict relative to the American values of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness on the one hand, and the Canadian values of peace, order, and good government on the other, we can discern that the monastic values of obedience, stability, and conversion of life lend themselves to a creative tension between independence and interdependence. Responsible Christian discipleship and healthy Christian community depend upon these two things. The tension between independence and interdependence never fully resolves, but resolution isn't the point. The point is for us to pursue true happiness, which is found only in the service of God, and God is best served when we serve others and allow others to serve us in a faithful and loving community. 
At that monastery where I first encountered Benedictine values, I remember celebrating both the 4th of July and the 11th of July with thanksgiving and prayer, though Brother Pierre, originally from Quebec, might have celebrated the 1st of July in contemplative celebration in his cell. The monks who offered me hospitality knew what it meant both to take responsibility for their own lives of faith and to rely on each other to sustain a community of faith that was both contemplative and active. As a parish community, St. Thomas's is called to the same stability and continual conversion of life to which Benedict called his monks. We are called to stability and community both in times of pa pandemic and in times of prosperity. We are called as well to use our independence in serving and building up each other and the wider community as we build relationships of interdependence with our neighbors and friends both near and far. If the 4th of July is Independence Day, perhaps the 1st of July should be called Interdependence Day. For this is how I have come to think of Canada Day in light of the Feast of St. Benedict. In any event, all of us must approach parish life as a school for the Lord's service, as Benedict describes the monastery in his rule, wherein we may together learn more profoundly how to be both independent and interdependent as we grow into the full stature of Christ together. I am honored to lead this parish into the post-pandemic era as we serve God and each other in Christ Jesus, and in that service, together pursue the only kind of happiness that leads to perfect freedom. Yours in Christ's ser service, Father Nathan Humphrey, the eighth rector of St. Thomas's. Almighty God, shine, we pray thee, in our hearts, that we also in our generation may show forth thy praises, who has called us out of darkness into thy marvelous light. May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. As Father Humphrey mentions in his pastoral letter, when we hear about St. Benedict, most of us are likely to think right away about his rule, a practical program for monks which has been organically adapted and developed in various times and places down throughout the ages. The teaching of St. Benedict as represented in the rule, to say the least, has had a vast impact on the church and Western civilization through its balanced emphasis on the role of the cross, the book, and the plow in its vision of communal Christian life. But this impact of Benedict is particularly surprising because what he does not offer is a kind of modern master plan for the revolution and rebuilding of church and civilization. Instead, as Andre Goosehurst Moore puts it so well in his book, Glory in All Things, there is no Benedictine scheme beyond the sense that we live and work only now, in the present moment, in which we should, however, be as fully aware as we can of the eternal. Both past and future are left to God. At the opposite end of the spectrum to the rule in many ways is the life of Benedict by Gregory the Great, a lesser known work, but one that is in and of itself exercised an influence of its own throughout the Christian tradition. As in so many works of hagiography, 
In the life, we encounter a kind of superhero figure depicted at the extreme end of devotion and receptivity to the power of God. The life consists largely of accounts of the miracles of Saint Benedict. Some find great inspiration in such stories of miraculous events, others less so. But wherever we land on this spectrum, it is fascinating and important to consider how the life of Benedict contextualizes these many miracles as a way for us to get at how the spirit of Saint Benedict can still be an inspiration for Christian living today in the midst of the circumstances of our own time and place. There are five key miracle stories highlighted at the beginning of the life. First, Saint Benedict is approached by a group of concerned monks living in a monastery at the top of a mountain. We are told that Benedict founded three in such a location. Their concern is with the danger of having to descend each day down the steep, jagged, rocky, rocky cliffs to collect water for daily needs from the lake below. And they suggest to Saint Benedict that they need to move somewhere else because of this danger. And yet, Saint Benedict acts and causes water to pour forth from the rock in that place so that the monks can safely remain in their monastery and still have their basic daily needs met. Second, an aspirant monk is given a tool to be used to clear away the thorn bushes in an area that was intended to be planted as a garden. But while zealous, zealously using it, the metal tool breaks loose from the handle and flies into the adjacent lake, sinking to the bottom. Saint Benedict takes the broken handle and dips it into the water, at which point the tool floats up from the bottom and reattaches itself to the handle allowing the work of cultivating the garden to continue and overcoming that aspirant monk's great embarrassment. Third, a boy is sent to fetch water from the lake, but carelessly lowering the bucket, falls into the lake and is carried away by the current. Before he drowns, Benedict sends a follower of his, Morris, to rescue the boy. And without realizing it in the moment, Morris is miraculously given the ability to walk on water in order to pull the boy to safety from the waters to save him from drowning. Fourth, Benedict is given the ability to discern that a loaf of bread given to him by a jealous rival of his, a local priest named Florentius, is laced with poison and with the assistance of a raven who regularly visited him to take bread out of Benedict's hand, the loaf is moved out of harm's way so that no creature will be poisoned by it. And fifth, when his enemy priest Florentius is killed in an accident, a building collapse, the last miracle described is that of Saint Benedict sobbing with grief either because his disciples were gloating over his enemy's death or because of the result of this unfortunate accident in self. Here, interestingly enough, compassion and the love of enemies is depicted as a miracle. Within the text of the life, St. Gregory's dialogue partner, Peter, Re recognizes how astonishing it is that not only were these miracles performed, but also that in the water pouring from the rock, we can see Moses. In the iron which came back from the depths of the water, we can see Elisha. In the walking on the water, we can see Peter. In the obedience of the raven, we can see Elijah. 
And in the grief at the death of his enemy, we can see King David. Fascinatingly, the life presents these miracles within a biblical framework, showing how the events of the Old Testament are fulfilled in Christ, in whom is made available for us in space and time, in the midst of our lives, often through his saints, the wisdom, righteousness, justice, and ultimately the love of God, of which our scripture readings speak today. At this moment of recognition by Peter, St. Gregory describes for us how Benedict the man of the Lord possessed the spirit not of all just men from the past, but instead he possessed the spirit of only one person, of Christ, of him who has filled the hearts of all the elect by granting them the grace of redemption. The one of whom St. John said in his gospel, he was the true light who illuminates every man coming into this world. And it is also written of him, of his fullness we have all received. Even if the light of Christ shines within us and around us in far less dramatic or obvious ways than what is presented in the life of St. Benedict. Let us be inspired today to strive to discern how the true light has and is illuminating our hearts and our lives, shining forth even in the midst of the shadows of this world of ours, a world that, like St. Benedict's own, is one marked by equal parts, decadence, and decay. Where are you able to recognize this light, this light which illuminates our hearts and our minds? Where are you able to recognize this fullness that we have received in Christ? In our own personal way, given our own unique calling to live out our Christian vocation, and together as a parish, as we emerge bit by bit from such a challenging time, as we welcome our next rector, our present rector, Father Humphrey, let us together take the invitation of St. Benedict to heart this day, which is ultimately the invitation to open our hearts, to open our minds, open our wills, our eyes, and our ears to the God of love so that we might be schooled in the way of love, in the service of the Lord, within the school of charity, which is his church. As the rule of St. Benedict begins, so we are summoned today as we are every day Listen, my son, to the master's instructions and take them to heart. These are the instructions of a loving father. Receive them gladly and carry them out to good effect so that by the efforts of obedience, you may return to him from whom you have withdrawn through the laziness of disobedience. Let us open our eyes to the divine light and listen carefully to what the divine voice tells us to do when it cries out each day. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Amen.
All that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. All things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. Amen. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, let us pray for the church and for the world. Lord, in thy mercy, we beseech thee in your prayer. I gave your prayers to the church universal throughout the world, for Andrew, our bishop, and for all who serve and minister to God's people. We pray this day especially for Father Nathan Humphrey as he begins his ministry as rector of this parish for his family as they prepare to move to Toronto, and for Father David Brinton in thanksgiving for his ministry as interim priest in charge. Lord, in thy mercy, I give your prayers for the Queen and for all in authority in our nation, province, and city. Guide the people of this land and of all nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in thy mercy, we please to be our prayer. I bid your prayers for all those in need, for the sick, Dylan, Michael, Andrew, JP, Jennifer, Wendy, Mary, Louise, Donald, Jeffrey Earl, Susan Clark, Mother Joyce Barnett, Father Walter Raven, Maria, John Spears, Susan Donaldson, Raymond Poe, Kate Major, Christine and Lucette Helen, and all those suffering from the coronavirus, for elders in isolation, for prisoners, for refugees and migrants, for the oppressed, for those who mourn, and for all for whom our prayers are asked. Jim, Bill, Janet, Crystal, Margaret, Eris, Vanessa, Douglas, Susan, Ray, John, Sean, Leo, <coughs> Linda, Marion, Priscilla, David O'Rourke, Bonnie, Sherry, Sweego, Michael Jones, and Tom. <coughs> May God give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of his salvation. Lord, in thy mercy, we beseech thee in prayer. I bid your prayers for the souls of the departed. Ruth Mallet, Irene Sheridan, and Robert Maloon, who have died in recent days. And on their years mind, for Carolyn Little, Theodora Crowther, Letitia Gilbert, and Elizabeth Lemberger, that they may share with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Thomas, Blessed Benedict, and all the saints in God's eternal kingdom. Lord, in thy mercy, we beseech you to our prayer. Gracious and Holy Father, hear the prayers of thy people. Give to us the wisdom to discover thee the intelligence to understand thee, the diligence to seek after thee, the patience to wait for thee, eyes to behold thee, a heart to meditate upon thee, and a life to proclaim thee. Through the power of the Spirit of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Ye that do truly and earnestly repent of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbors, and intend to lead the new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways. Draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort, and make your humble confession to Almighty God, 
meekly kneeling upon your knees. Almighty God,
oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And to the Institute, and in this holy gospel, command us to continue a perpetual memorial of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we will something beseech thee, and grant that we, receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who, in the same way that he was betrayed, took bread. And we have given thanks, he break it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for men for the remission of sins. Do this as often as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, we, thy humble servants of all thy holy church, remembering the precious death of thy beloved Son, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again in glory, do make before thee in the sacraments of the holy bread and eternal life, and the cup of everlasting salvation, the memorial which he hath commanded. And we entirely desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Most humbly beseech thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And we pray that by the power of thy Holy Spirit, all we who are partakers of this holy communion may be fulfilled with thy grace and heavenly benediction. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ hath commanded and taught us, we are bold to say,
Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, you must heartily thank me for thou dost graciously feed us in these holy mysteries. With the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, assuring us thereby thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are living members of his mystical body, which is the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee. And although we are unworthy, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost is all honor and glory, world without end. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of the love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you all.